We're here to worship the Lord this morning. I'm just thankful and privileged to be here, to be up here, to bring God's word. And I just, uh, uh, I just can't express my gratitude. I just thank God for his word. Do you? I thank him for his sustenance and his carrying us through each and every day. But here we are in this new series, as we all need confidence in trials, right? We've looked at specific individual trials so far, like Joseph, Moses, and Ruth. But today, we're going to look at another individual trial that I believe we all, the church, collectively share in today, that we share together in this trial, a trial we all together face. As we go through this series, we'll get back to individual trials, but today we're going to look at a trial universal to us all. How many of you have seen these commercials on by AT&T? Oh, sir, that was my grandma's. Oh. Don't worry, ma'am. All of your stuff is in okay hands. Just okay? Well, they don't give two and a half stars to just anybody. Here you go. What's this? It's your piano. Hold this for a sec. We don't have a piano. But the neighbors do. Just okay is not okay, especially when it comes to your network. AT&T is America's best wireless network according to America's biggest test. Good now with 5G evolution, the first step to 5G. More for your thing. That's all okay. Oh, sir, that was my grandma's. <laughs> this ride safe? Assembled it myself last night. I think I did an okay job. Just okay? What if something bad happens? We just moved in the next town. Just okay is not okay, especially when it comes to your network. AT&T is America's best. <laughs> well, hey, I guess AT&T believes just okay is not okay. Now, you can make a decision whether AT&T is better than okay. We're not plugging them, but that's the question. Is okay just okay? You know? I believe that most Bible-believing Christians would agree that America is undergoing a spiritual and moral decline, a free fall, from the rich moral heritage we once knew. America's moral decay and, distancing, and the distancing of itself from God, from His laws, inundated into our government. It's inundated into our entire education system. It's inundated into our court system, into our media, and on it goes, and even has entered into the professing church today. Did you know back in 1961, John Hale, where are you at? When John was in second grade, he went to IPS school 61. I went to 108. You went to 108 later, right? In second grade, in 1961, in the public school system of IPS, John, your teacher would lead the class in song, singing what? Holy, holy, holy. holy. At IPS, 1961. What has happened? It seems as Isaiah has said, righteousness stands far away, for truth has stumbled in the street. What is happening? What is going on? The trial of the temptation we may feel is that we may be overwhelmed. The trial to feel that the situation we find ourselves in is hopeless. That we can't make a difference. That we're not adequate. That we may not have the tools or the resources to compete with someone else. Or that I may not have the tools or resources to make any impact whatsoever for our society has fallen. The trial of the temptation to just withdraw. To withdraw. And to withdraw to our circles. And just stay within the Christian community until we either die 
or the Lord takes us in the rapture. Is survival just okay? God would say, no, it is not. God has more in mind for his true church than just survival. Amen? God has called his people to be more than conquerors and for his church to storm the very gates of hell. That has not changed. So this morning we're going to take a moment and we're going to go look at a man named Gideon. This will be part one of two. Next week will be the second part. I encourage you to be here next week for the finish on Gideon. It's very important. But this is part one of two in the overall confidence and trial series. And then we'll move on to someone else. So Gideon, what's going on? He's a believer in the true God. He was caught up in the judgment of God upon the nation of Israel, and he was just trying to survive. He was just trying to make it through. But God had other plans for Gideon. Plans to make him a difference maker, not just a survivor. Plans to do something in his life, not just hide until he comes. Do you know God can make you a difference maker amongst your friends? He can make you a difference worker among his co- your co-workers at home, at school, on the job, in your community. He can make you a difference maker in this city. And if he cho- so chooses, he can make you a difference maker for the world. Do you know this? God can make a warrior out of the weakest, a fighter out of the fearful, a hero out of the helpless. Which do you want to be? A warrior, a fighter, a hero, or weak, fearful, and helpless? Not the latter, right? Lord, I just pray this morning as we look at this trial we face, as we look at the life of Gideon, I pray, Lord, that you will encourage us, that you will embolden us, that we will realize what you can do that we do not have to walk in fear. I thank you, Lord, for this church. I thank you for each person here today. May we give you glory. I thank you for the singing this morning. Lord, we have confidence in you. You are the mighty warrior. Lord, nothing, nothing apart from you can happen to us apart from you. I thank you, Lord, for your love. I thank you for our salvation. I thank you that you have given us the truth. And you've given us a purpose. In your name we pray. Amen. So you ready to get into the Bible? All right, let's get into the Bible. Let's do a little bit of scripture reading here. So we can just get the feel. Judges 6, 1 through 16. Then the sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord gave them into the hands of Midian seven years. The power of Midian prevailed against Israel. Because of Midian, the sons of Israel made for themselves the dens which were in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. For it was when, for it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites would come up with the Amalekites and the sons of the east and go against them. So they would camp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel as well as no sheep, ox, or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock in their tents. They would come in like locusts for number. Both they and their camels were innumerable, and they came into the land to devastate it. So Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. Now it came about when the sons of Israel cried to the Lord on account of Midian, that the Lord sent a prophet to the sons of Israel. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, It was I who brought you up from Egypt and brought you out from the house of slavery. I delivered you from the hands of the Egyptians and from the hands of all your oppressors and dispossessed them before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not obeyed me. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak tree that was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, the Abyssalite, as his son Gideon, was beating out wheat in the wine press in order to save it from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. 
Then Gideon said to him, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord looked at him and said, Go in this your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? He said to him, O oh Lord, how shall I deliver Israel? Behold, my family is the least in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my father's house. But the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat Midian as one man. Imagine the scene. Imagine this taking place. So first, today, let's look at God's call. I mean, Gideon's call to be a warrior for God. Go back to verse 11. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak tree. Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press in order to save it from the Midianites. Here's our very first view of Gideon, and we find him what? Beating out the wheat in the wine press in order to save the wheat from the Midianites. In other words, the story opens on a scene of defeat. It opens on a scene of despair. See, in that day, instead of winnowing the wheat harvest as it was normally done on the open mountaintops in view of everyone, where the wind would blow and separate the wheat from the shaft in large quantities, that's what would be done. Gideon is now hiding in a wine press, beating or knocking out wheat with a stick. Here's a wine press. And you can imagine Gideon hiding behind the wall. This would be an ancient wine press in Israel. Imagine no grapes in there. That wine press would be deeper. There's a wall around it. Gideon's down low. You can't see him beating the wheat. This is what very poor people did with their meager amounts of wheat, such as Ruth would do, as, that we looked at in Ruth 2.17. So why? Why is this happening? It tells us he's trying to save the wheat from who? The Midianites. Judges 6, 1 through 7 that we just read tells the story. The Midianites here, along with the Amalekites, were fierce, and they were very wicked, nomadic people. And for seven years, annually, they swept into Israel like locusts at harvest time. Why? To plunder them, to raid their crops, to steal their cattle, and kill at will. This is what was happening to them. Gideon's own brother was actually killed in one of the raids. You see in chapter 8, verse 19. They came and they took what they wanted. They took not only what they wanted, they stayed as long as they wanted. And they uh, did whatever they pleased within the land. What did Israel do? It says they ran to the hills to hide in caves until they left. Until these terrorists left their region, left their country. But they left with their crops destroyed, their cattle stolen, and they were near starvation at this time in Israel. So now you understand why Gideon is hiding his wheat. Why is in this wine press? Why is all this happening to Israel? Other nations should take a warning from the answer to the question. The nations must realize that God is a God of justice, is he not? Judges 6 1 tells us why. That all this was God's judgment upon the nation. It tells us why. For they did evil in the sight of God. They did evil in the sight of God. And as a nation, in, verse, in chapter 3, verse 7, they forgot the Lord their God and they served the Baals. So not only are they doing evil in the sight of God, but they're adding on to their sinfulness idol worship. Judges 6.6, 6, so Israel was brought very low because of Midian. God is chastening the nation. He's disciplining the evil lifestyle and behavior of the nation. They were brought low by God 
that they might see the high price of sin. Not only do we see this recorded in God's word, it's so that everyone else and every other nation may see the very same price. You know, though we in the United States are not Israel, and never compare the United States when the Bible talks about Israel in context. But America may soon find itself under the judgment of God. And we, like Gideon, may find ourselves caught up in that judgment. Gideon is caught up in the judgment. He's living there amongst the people. He's going through the same crisis. Do you know if we're left here and God and we haven't been raptured and God brings justice and punishment on the nation of the United States of America, we will go through that with the nation. Amen? We are in a trial now during this time of moral decay, but that trial may become even harder in the future if God so chooses to give America what she deserves. If there's no repentance. Therefore, it is in this dire situation that we find Gideon hiding, trying to survive. But here's the amazing thing God never ceases to amaze us, does He? Look what the Lord did in verse 12. Oh, valiant warrior, mighty warrior. Mighty man of valor. The translation of one Jewish commentary. Oh, brave hero. What? Who are you talking to? Gideon, the weakest, the youngest, the one hiding. Oh, valiant warrior, mighty warrior, man of valor. I mean, is God just poking fun at Gideon here? Is God just being sarcastic and facetious? Is that how God acts? No. God was not making fun of Gideon. He was not being sarcastic towards Gideon. What you see here, God sees Gideon as he can be and will be if he will only let God work through him. God sees what Gideon can be. O valiant warrior. O man of God. O man of valor. Go, said the Lord, and this your strength, and deliver Israel. Verse 14. Are you kidding, Lord? Have you seen these people who've been whipping up on us for seven years? Oh, Lord, how shall I deliver Israel, he says. Or, pardon me, Lord, how can I save Israel? Gideon, you are in the presence of the Lord himself, and you ask this question? The Lord himself is there speaking to him, and this is what you say? We too have the same presence of the same Lord in the times we now live in. Amen? And we so often adopt these same attitudes, these same questions, and we ask the same questions. Lord, How can I do what you tell me to do? How can I make a difference in the land? How can I be what you call me to be? Have you not seen the climate we live in? Hear me now. This here, this question is exactly the wrong question and the wrong response to the call of God. We must remember this. Here lies the problem that we so often see in our lives, the temptation. That is a question focused on self. This is the question that comes up with all kinds of excuses for lack of action, for lack of obedience. We ask God and look at ourselves. It's hopeless. The task is too great. We're the least in Indianapolis. We're the least amongst the megas. Who am I and what can I do in my neighborhood? Have you seen the school system? How can I share Christ in the public school? Lord, are you kidding me? Didn't you know who you're talking to? 
Hmm. We need to quit looking at our weaknesses, our circumstances, what's going on in the nation around us, our lack of this latest talent or our lack of ability. And we need to set our eyes upon Almighty God, the God who has called us. God did not call Gideon to go it alone. He said, go in this, which is me, your strength, and deliver Israel. Not the strength he had in himself, but the strength he would have in the Lord who was going to be with him if he would just be a man of valor, a valiant warrior. Judges 6.16, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat Midian as one man. One man. The victory that I will give you, that you think is impossible, will be as easy as as if the entire Midianite army was one man. What you worried about? Go in this. Your strength. Me. Oh, how we need to see who we can be in the Lord. Who are you in God? Who are you in Jesus Christ? We need to see ourselves as God sees us, working through us, and not see ourselves in our own strength. It's when we focus on self, which we tend to do, we see the impossibility of the situation. But with God working through us, no situation is impossible. How do you see yourself? Do you see yourself in the way you are in your own strength, or do you see Yourself the way God sees you. Are you in fear in the trial of living for God in this current society? Does your Christian life resemble the people in these pits in your heart? Or does this better describe who you are in the Lord and how you live today? How do you see yourself with God working through you? Who do you want to be? We need heroes and warriors for God today who will step up, who will step out of the masses of mediocrity and come out of the wine presses of fear and defeat and take the hand of God Almighty, the power of His presence, the confidence of His promises, and be all He would have us be in His strength. Do you know that you can be a mighty warrior for God? in the midst of the decay of an immoral society. Every weakness you have is an opportunity for God to show His strength in your life, regardless of the circumstance. In His strength, you can experience victory over your vices. In His strength, you can have a home that is a haven. In His strength, you can have that wonderful marriage. You can be that bright, light, shining witness. You can live a holy life, as we sang this morning. You can live above any circumstances God may call us to as a church collectively in a nation deteriorating around us. In His strength, we can resist all temptation. In His strength, we can impact our area and influence people for the Lord. In His strength, you truly, truly can be a difference maker even where the Midianites have full sway in society. Come on, people. Do you, do you believe this? Even if the nation is under the chastening hand of God and the morality of the world surrounding you looks too powerful. You see, this is what we must remind ourselves of the truth. It is not okay to just be okay. God has not called His church to lie low to make no waves, to hide in the wine presses of safety and just survive the moral decline around us. The church is not a cruise ship. The church is a battleship. God has called His church to storm the very gates of hell, Matthew 16, 18, and deliver the lost, Acts 26, 18, from the dominion of Satan to God. And nothing has changed. If anything, we have more opportunity today. Praise God. Today, 
we need to pray for one another. We need to pray for the overall church. That the church today get up and get out of its dens, get out of its caves of self-made securities and godless, faithless compromise, and just go. Whatever God may have called you to do in the Lord's strength, believing His timeless, ageless, forever promise that I am with you. That I am with you. That I'm going to be there each and every step of the way. Have no fear. You with me? Amen. We're living in a trial in our nation. We must not allow Satan to send us into hiding. Because the enemy is too great. That's not true. Because we believe we have the power of God to make a difference. We must see ourselves as God sees who we can be. If we walk in the confidence of God, we will see God move and work through your life. But you must be willing to be used. Gideon's call to be a warrior from God. We're going to close with Gideon's test of obedience to God. Look at verses 25 through 32. Now on the same night the Lord said to him, Take your father's bull and a second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal, which belongs to your father, and cut down the Asherah that is beside it, and build an altar to the Lord your God on the top of this stronghold in an orderly manner. And take a second bull and offer a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah, which you shall cut down. Gideon's first assignment from God as Israel's chosen warrior and deliverer was what? It was not to go to the battlefront and engage the Midianites. That's going to come later. Something had to be done first. Go home and tear down the idol to Baal that was in his father's house. And replace it with the true altar to the true God. Notice something here. There is no compromise with God to who is Lord. You with me? So Gideon, what did he do? Verse 27, he took ten men. And it said, did as the Lord had spoken to him. While our hero did as he was commanded, (laughs) what do we see? It was not exactly like throwing his body over a hand grenade for his bros. You with me? What did he do? God sees fit to record this about Gideon. He was too afraid to do it in the daylight, (laughs) so he did it at night. (laughs) He still did it, but he did it in the cover of darkness. You with me? Don't you love the absolute honesty and integrity of God's word? It shows us its heroes and all of their humanity. See, God shows us who we truly are. There's no photoshopping going on with God. You see, we get what we get. Poor Gideon, he went there at night. But at least he went. Gideon's fear was that the townspeople would not just try to stop him, but they would kill him. Does that tell you how far Israel's deteriorated, that if you tear down a bale, they'll kill you for it? Whoa. And he was right to think that. But we know God wouldn't have allowed that because God just called him a valiant warrior and told him what to go do. In the morning when the city saw what happened, they were furious, verse 30. Then the men of the city said to Joash, Bring out your son, that he may die, for he has torn down the altar of Baal, and indeed he has cut down the Asherah, which was beside it. Bring him out here. We're going to kill him. What? (laughs) You know, don't you? Nothing's changed. That even today when you step out and you step up and you kick over men's idols in society today, whether they be of mind, body, or spirit, you will never be well-liked. You will still be persecuted. John 15, 18 through 20. But sadly, in the condition we live in today, it may come right from within those who are professing believers when you try to tear down bales and asherah poles in the believer's life. 
But also, what a sad, sad commentary on how far Israel had fallen. How far God's people Israel have fallen, and so many even today have fallen, that they would be more grieved over their fallen idols than their grieved God Almighty who they disobey. Wow. What do we know from Deuteronomy? Deuteronomy 13, 6-11 stipulated that they, the idol worshippers, should have been stoned to death. But now they want to kill the person who's tearing down the idols. But it said here they are wanting to stone the one man who was obeying the word and promoting the worship of the one true God. How far has it transitioned? I mean, what is going on? What is Israel a vivid picture of? It's a vivid picture of just how far one can fall away when obedience to God is set aside and sin begins to be tolerated. Today, the United States of America is mimicking Israel, and so much of the church looks just like the world. Yet, we can be used of God collectively, even now, as we face that trial together. Do you believe that? Do you still have hope that God can use you? Israel was supposed to go into the promised land and drive out all the nations and their false god. But Israel didn't do that. We know this. Here's the repeated refrain throughout Judges is that they did not, quote, drive them out, Judges 1.28. They did not do what they were commanded to do. They compromised and allowed them to remain as a grievous source of temptation. What started as disobedience and compromise led to corruption and defection. That's the pathway, my friends, to sin. There is the path that leads to sin, so you disobey. Then you compromise. Then you become corrupt. And then you will defect. Every sin tolerated paves the way for more toleration of more sin and corruption, an ever-increasing downward spiral into a deeper depravity and distance from God. And this is exactly what's happening in Israel, and this is exactly what's happening today in our nation. It's exactly what happened to the people. It's exactly what's happening within the church. But what we must say is, we will not allow it to happen to me through the Holy Spirit's strength and power. But there's a principle here that we must not miss. One God desperately wants us to see. And that's before God sent Gideon off to fight the army of the Midianites. He sent him home to tear down the Baals in his own house. Gideon was obviously aware of his father's Baal worship, but apparently had come to live with it. Apparently, he started to tolerate it compromise with it, and accept it as common practice. But God said, before I use you, I have none of that. None of that. I'm not going to have any of that. So go start there. The first step to be an instrument of deliverance on a large scale was to start a reformation at home. It was to start a reformation at home. Deal with the sin in his own backyard. Clean up his very act at his home. Clean up his very act in his heart. Get his own house in order, putting obedience into practice with the things right at hand, with the things right at home. Do what he ought to do and what he ought to have already done. You know, the truth is, We cannot hope to be a cut above the world until we first cut down the idols in our own and hearts and get rid of anything that is displeasing and displacing our Lord. How can you be a cut above if you won't cut down? Cut down those bales. Cut down those astral poles. The secular idols, what are they? How many of you go around in, in America and say, oh, look at that cool bale? statue in their front yard. How many of you see Baal statues? I mean, what are our idols today? Popularity, pleasure, possessions, fashion, money, 
sex, status, self-love, and on and on it goes that are put in the place of the soul love and devotion that should belong to our Lord as we prop up these idols in our life. And we must realize, okay, Lord, I'm hearing you loud and clear. I know I can deal with the trial in this nation collectively with my brothers and sisters, but I'm hearing you that I need to tear down the bale in my own home and in my own heart and do no evil in the sight of the Lord, 6.1. And do no disobedience of his word, 636. That's your heart for me. That's your goal for me. Let me have that as my purpose and desire to serve you. Lord, let me not put you on the back and put another in place of you or have an altar in my home. Let you be my sole object of worship. Let you be my sole object of devotion and service and obedience. For the truth is we will not have his power to impact our world, to impact our society until we take care of that issue in our own lives. All of us upon reflection can think of those things that we can do and ought to do right now that would please the Lord. I guarantee there's all, all of us here can see things we should be doing right now to benefit the kingdom. To encourage the saints. To bring purity into our lives and allow the Lord to wash us clean. It's called holy living. Let's just call it what it is. Godly living, guess what? Is infectious. It's infectious. How many of you want to infect somebody? It's, it's infectious to the ones God's called. Because if you're willing, God's going to take you to them. Salt and light. What happened? Gideon's father took heart. He stood up for his son against the people. And later, what happened? Many of the people in the hometown came out to fight the enemy. So we've seen God's, Gideon's call to be a warrior of God. Gideon's test of obedience to God. Next week, we're going to come out and close this two-parter in this series. Gideon's lesson on the power of God. How many of you want to truly tap into the power of God? We can. Remember the song we just sang? I feel unqualified for what you are calling me to do. But Lord, with your strength, I've got no excuse because broken people are exactly who you use. You know, as a matter of fact, God specializes in working with weakness. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1, 26-29. Don't we love this, these verses? For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world, and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. God gets all credit. God calls and uses the foolish. He uses the weak, the despised, the things that are not, which is what? That is, the nothings and the nobodies in the eyes of this world. So that no man may be able to boast before God. Hear me. Your weakness is not grounds for your dismissal. Amen? Amen? Your weakness is not grounds for dismissal, but rather the very grounds for God's strength and all His glory to flow right through you, and when it is coupled with obedience and dependence upon God, you will be a valiant warrior. You will be a man of valor. You will be a hero of the faith. You'll be used as God wants to use you. So if you are weak, if you're nobody in society, you're just the kind of person God is recruiting for his team. He can use you no matter what. We here at ECGBC, we can make a difference in our community. We can conquer anything God's called us to conquer. 
We don't have to worry about the trends. We don't have to worry about society. We don't have to worry about the moral decay or the moral depravity. We don't have to worry about everything we're up against. In fact, the bigger we're up against it, the bigger the giant, the harder they fall. We just have to be who God is calling us to be and walk in His truth. I love that, don't you? We have to remember the wonderful words of God. I am with you. I am with you. Today, I would like to challenge you to believe that God can do more through you than you can even imagine. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter your position in society. It doesn't matter what you have or don't have. It matters about your willingness and your submission to God. Don't you love that? It's not okay to just survive. But it is okay to thrive. It really is. I would exhort you to look at your heart, to look at your home, and see if there are any veils in your life. Anything that needs to be disposed of. Any ash repuls that need to be torn down. And do it. And do it today. Say, Lord, I will do it today. You will open up the door to God's power and blessing in your heart. And in your home. And even if others may not follow you, you'll be in the right place that God has for you. You will be well on your way to be used by God in a collective trial that we all find ourselves in. And I'm willing to be with you to say, hey, no matter what's going on in the land, let's stand together collectively and face the trial together. Are you? We can have confidence in trials. So please, Let's stand and sing.